I've always been really interested in merchandising. Um, I've seen it from many different angles, and what I love most about it is how sometimes the smallest tweaks can, can change the consumer's behavior. So. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm James Ingold. I've been with IQ Metrics for a year and a half now, and I got involved with them uh, as the content curator for our XQ project, which is um, you know, our, our take at digital merchandising um, and bring it to that into the bricks and mortar store and beyond. Um, so the nice thing about what that position's done for me is it's enabled me to have a really broad view of seeing all the data that is available, um, where it comes from our partners of carriers, vendors, uh, manufacturers, and other partners, taking it into our system, working with it, and then finally, the most exciting part, um, pushing it out to dealers and seeing what, what you guys do with this data, um, the creative ways that, that people get involved with their own digital merchandising. Um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, what we're going to go through here today. Um, we're going to start with just a quick uh, run through of how merchandising has changed uh, and evolved throughout the years. We'll then spend some time going over some uh, merchandising strategies that you use in the physical space and then how that relates to, to merchandising in the digital space. We'll also talk and, and cover over quickly how you can infuse your own brand and personality uh, into XQ. And then using RQ4 um, and BI reporting to make really informed and strategic merchandising decisions. And then finally, merchandising, digital merchandising and how that can fit into your overall omni-channel experience. So by going through these, what we really hope to do is to spark ideas of strategies that you can take and uh, cater to your own needs and, and really kind of explore them and make, make your, mer your merchandising and your stores come alive. Uh, so merchandising, that's quickly, what, what is merchandising? It's making a visual connection between what you're selling and what a customer needs and wants. So we're going to start here that merchandising, it's an art form, and it's been around since the beginning of transactional commerce. Um, it's been practiced for a long time, so we're going to go back in time a little bit just to set the context and see what, how things have changed and evolved, uh, the needs of the customers have changed and evolved, and so have this, the strategies that retailers use to meet those needs. So by bringing up a few of those uh, historical examples, we'll set the context for, for where things are going now and why digital merchandising is, is you know, the way of the future. So here I've got a picture. We hop back 500 years, and um, there's someone uh, working at a medieval market. There is uh, one group of uh, retailers in uh, medieval markets who are called hawkers. And what they'd do is early in the morning when everything was plentiful, there are lots of goods available, lots of selection, uh, they'd pick up a whole bunch of goods uh, when competition was also fierce and they could get them at great prices. Then later on in the day, some people like myself who forget to get the milk until 9 o'clock at night and go there and find that the store is pretty well sold out, then these hawkers would come back and they'd set out their wares for everyone to see. So, you know, at first, you're like, oh, well, that seems a little underhanded, and maybe it was on behalf of these particular people. But at the same time, what they're doing is bringing value to people. They, they notice that people still need these goods late in the day, and they found a way to bring that to them. And, and this technique still is around today, although it's just evolved. Um, retailers become a little more creative in how they deal with these uh, situations, and they still have limited stock in their locations, but, but when we um, in which they've, they've turned things around um, and increased availability and brought more value to their customers is by providing uh, direct shipping of products if they're not in inventory um, directly to the, to the consumer's home. So that's, this just evolved throughout the years. Yeah, and, and also a much better way of doing things, I think. It leaves the customer happy, it leaves them happy, and it's just great overall. So. Hopping forward a few hundred years, here we are, 1910 Boomtown, let's say Midwest US. Uh, we've got an old general store, and looking at that, the first thing I think is, wow, that is just a jumble of products. Except for, I would posit that this too is actually a subtle form of merchandising. Um, what the, the, the retailer has done in this case is, if you think about it, 
you look at that, and this jumble of products actually closely resembles the cupboards and cellars that people would have. Um, and by doing, making that kind of visual connection, what they do is remind a customer subtly, oh yeah, I need to buy in large bulk quantities um, so that I can store up for the seasons and the time that it takes to get to the store. But what that does for the retailer then is actually drive sales. So and again, this still exists today. Uh, you see this in all the big supermarkets and big box stores. Um, and these stores have a very different appearance uh, than your retail locations, and there's very specific reason for that. You sell much different products. Uh, your products um, are, are devices that are periodically purchased, um, and they generally require some very careful considerations. Uh, so, of course, um, your merchandising strategy is much different. It's clean and neat. It allows uh, people to take a really careful, close look at your products. Um, visual merchandising took a, a, another kind of shift or change um, with the invention of the department store. Uh, this is uh, the Bon Marché. It was uh, opened in 1938. And what um, happened here is that now all of these general goods were brought under one roof um, and then separated into separate departments. So they had to be very strategic now, create different merchandising strategies in each department, have specialized sales staff, staff in each of these departments. Um, and, and really cater towards different types of consumers all under one roof. Um, think of uh, today's um, makeup counter. It's specifically merchandise um, to target certain customers and has um, very specialized sales staff manning those counters. And in many ways, this is also kind of the birth of something like the Apple Genius Bar, where people are looking for specialization and excellent service. And it's the same thing that uh, you have in your own stores. Although, so though you're not on, in a large department store where things are in really um, large separate areas, um, what you've got is a subtle departmentalization. And why that's important is because customers expect something different when they're at a customer service counter or when they're moving over to a device island um, or between any of those kinds of areas. Their expectations change and, and that's really important to let your sales staff know that um, they can prepare for that and kind of work it into their process. So now what we're going to jump forward straight to today. and I'm going to highlight some of the realities that we're dealing with and why we think that digital merchandising is the key response to those trends. For today's wireless consumers, their needs and wants have changed, and so must our strategies. So I'm going to highlight a number of notable trends. And the first one that I'm going to point out is that people prepare for important purchases. And the internet is really a big part of what has done this to us. Uh, people will talk to their friends, uh, go to expert reviews, other Views. Uh, I've put up an example here of Toyota's website for the Prius. People love things like this fuel consumption chart on the side. It, it, it not only tells them that something is worthwhile and of value to them, but it shows them in a really visual way. And it's no different in the mobile space. Um, customers will carefully look at all their options. So they'll, they'll spend a ton of time at home researching, comparing prices, asking uh, friends for their opinions. Um, and they expect to get that same kind of information when they enter your store. Uh, they expect your sales staff to, to have all the information that they can get at home um, available to them when they enter your retail location. And this isn't exclusive to the younger generations either. Uh, even many of our grandmothers are, are starting to become pretty fluent in texting and using tablets and so on. Yeah. Not only some of our grandmothers, but my grandfather actually had a cell phone before I did. So that's saying something about how this is really cross-generational. So the second um, trend that we'd like to highlight is that more and more than ever, personalization and customization are key. When you've got these big, um, especially in the wireless industry, um, you make uh, relatively um, spaced out large purchases like buying a new cell phone. What you want to do is bring your own personal flair to that and that's really the birth of the case and what that's done um, for, for our stores and what we're selling. Um, so, but as another example of this, just another in other uh, retail environments too, even washing machines come in different colors. You've got your chrome, white, and red. Or 20 years ago, it might have been black, white, and avocado. Uh, George Blankenship, uh, also known as the architect of Apple's retail strategy, uh, he said certain things uh, that require the buyer to touch it or see its color in person 
um, or commodities, things that you can find anywhere, are best bought in person. Um, and retailers really need to capitalize on this. Uh, you need to create a very uh, visual experience that allows customers to interact with the products um, in a way that creates a connection with them or it speaks to them as an individual. So the last thing we're going to highlight, and I think it's been alluded to in the first point, is that um, increasingly the new generations are digital natives and they use and expect digital spaces. So um, more than ever, as this one uh, point, points out here, people aren't afraid to use uh, mobile technologies or, or even um, mobile commerce. So in June 2012, 10 billion this year is what um, one, one group has forecasted, and that's up from 6 billion in 2010. So it's moving quickly. Um, and just another a quick quote here from Doug Stevens, uh, the retail prophet. Uh, he said, the internet changed everything for consumers giving us boundless access to purchase research information. And in recent years, smart smartphones have put all that information right in the consumer's pockets. Uh, so in summary, it's important that uh, retailers involve along with their consumers. Such changes uh, to the consumer's decision process means that traditional strategies uh, used by retail marketers will no longer work. Uh, today's retail marketers must be quick as they are agile, in this digital era, uh, it's imperative that they are constantly studying con consumers' evolving pathways to purchase. So to excel in this market, a smart retailer needs to create merchandising that will cater to these three facets of today's consumer habits and preferences. So as you can see behind me, uh, integration of digital merchandising platforms in one stores is an increasingly great way of meeting those needs. And we're going to highlight XQ as one of those platforms because I am very familiar with it and <laughs> so I can, I can speak to that well. <laughs> so for those of you in the audience that aren't maybe as familiar with XQ, uh, it's a suite of products currently browse, ad play, and stream that are all focused on high levels of interaction as a way of attracting customers, engaging them, educating them on the way to, uh, to, to purchase. So through our development of XQ, we aim to make it a manifestation of, of those needs of today. To, we're we're de developing it towards um, those customers that use digital spaces, that love research, and that also want to customize. So it's a place where the medium matches the message. So now we're going to break into the basic techniques of good merchandising, and then how we can make them play out both in the physical space and then also with digital merchandising. Uh, so first off, we'll just go over uh, just what are the goals of merchandising. The purpose of visual merchandising is to make it easier for the customer to find uh, their desired product within your retail location. You also want to make it really easy for the customer to self-select without the aid of, of a staff person. It's also imp uh, important to make it possible for the shopper to coordinate um, additional accessories on their own. Uh, recommend, highlight, and demonstrate uh, particular products at strategic, strategic locations within uh, your retail location. And educate the customer about the product in an effective and creative way. It's, it's also important uh, to, to make proper arrangements uh, in such a way to increase the sale of unsought goods in your location as well. So I should note be right before we move on that all of these can be kind of put to practice on the small scale, on the large scale, and everywhere in between. And we've distilled them in a way, we hope, that you can um, put it to practice in, in any space. So we'll start off with one of, one of the most basic uh, merchandising techniques, and that's to keep displays really neat and clean, and basically just to keep it really simple. Uh, when you think of the most um, visually attractive and memorable images in your mind, uh, you're likely thinking of relatively simple ones. Uh, in, in order for your display to attract customers, uh, it's supposed, it needs to be interesting enough uh, to create that interest at one glance, but yet simple enough so that they can remember the products that they saw. So at the same time, cluttering your store with too many displays um, can be detrimental as well. So to avoid clutter, merchandise key products with lesser items uh, displayed more simply. 
Uh, here's an example of how maybe uh, too many products can, can be overwhelming. Uh, a display like this might be impressive to a customer and it might draw a lot of attention, uh, but it fails uh, is merchandising for a number of issues. It's cluttered and, and it discourage, in, discourages interaction. Uh, also, in the mobile industry, uh, we're talking about really expensive products that you're, you're merchandising. So there's some serious expenses involved um, in unboxing, unboxing these items for display. And I think this also highlights one of the other advantages of digital merchandising. So with carrier-designated planograms and, and other potential merchandising restrictions, um, you as individual retailers may not have the flexibility to, well, although we didn't suggest it, build a, a, a leaning tower of pizza out of cans there. Um, <laughs> so the, what I like to refer this to is the, the Kindle effect. So by taking an entire library of books and putting it in a digital space, you now have it on one device. And you can do the same thing with digital merchandising, where in your store you may have a very large inventory, but you can pull it together onto one screen. So similarly, We've got digital merchandising platform, and here I've highlighted XQ Browse that's running on an iPad, uh, or iPad version. This is something that's in, in beta right now, but it'll be uh, available in, for general availability in early 2013. So it's important to remember uh, when you're creating a browse playlist that you don't necessarily just use it as a dumping ground, that it's, it's, you want to kind of focus on certain strategies, target groups, and um, really help people to find exactly what they want quickly and painlessly. But of course, um, if you do want to display more items, the nice thing about um, digital merchandising platforms is they're designed in a way to kind of really distill things into small sections that are easy uh, for a customer to navigate. So you may have a lot of devices on this screen here, but only six are highlighted before someone swipes over. So they can quickly, their eyes identify what they're looking for, and they can drill down. So it's the composition of these groups. In this case, these six objects, there are these six phones that are really important in the way that you compose them. So as I've also mentioned earlier, customers do online research before making large purchases, like phones, televisions, or anything else like that. So the clean presentation and comparisons uh, do a lot to connect people um, between the online and offline spaces and create a more comfortable place where sales staff and customers coming into the store can feel comfortable together um, and not feel like one person has a set of knowledge that they don't. Where the sales staff is important then is their expertise is on helping people to identify what is really valuable, you say, so what are you using this for? And that's how this can help you. Another common and simple merchandising strategy is to uh, keep displays focused on groups of products or strategic product grouping. Uh, a good visual display will focus on one product or a small family of products. Uh, too many diverse products in one display uh, can be confusing to the customer. Uh, so here's an example of a, a camera store. And as you can see, uh, they've, they've included every possible camera that you can imagine. So looking at this display, I'm, I'm pretty overwhelmed with all my options. Uh, so the tr strategic thing to do would be to, to group these into smaller groups of, of and products families so that you could easily see the options that are available to you, uh, but not have such a, a overwhelming display. Um, here's another example of, of a kind of a, a really, uh, I think, creative visual strategy to merchandising. This is a pharmacy and, and what they've done here. So if you think about a traditional pharmacy, it's, it's aisles and aisles of, of uh, small products you need to pick up each package and, and read the small, the, the fine print before you can really find out what, what that product is. And so what they've done is visually grouped, um, you can see this is a periodic table, so what they've done is they've visually grouped the products um, by element, and so you could easily find the zinc lozenges you're looking for. Uh, but what it is is just a really uh, an example of how you can visually group products together and make it really simple for your customer to, to just find exactly what they're looking for. So here's an example of um, Browse running on the desktop. 
And the first example of product grouping that I'd like to give, I'm going to give three separate possible strategies here. And one is um, grouping within uh, what I've done here is highlight a sort of a, a, a single theme. And that theme here is going to be the brand that I'm, I'm kind of promoting here, which is the Motorola Droid series. Um, by putting the three products together, um, and I've just kind of if for the screenshot so you guys can see it easily from out there, blown it up and pulled it out a bit. But by putting the three together, you kind of subtly reinforce that idea that yes, this is, this is a, a line of devices that has a certain name and a connotation to it. It's that those, for the people that are leaning forward towards tech, they, they've got the great battery life and the max, and that's something that your sales staff can really engage a customer with. Here's a second uh, example of a different strategy, and this is um, taking it out of a mixed playlist and, and making a playlist that is specific to one theme, and that's uh, Android in this case. So put them all together, and then that's where the, the rest of the comparisons of differentiating them comes out of that. And of course, you could use any other theme like super phones, LTE, or anything else that's trending at the moment. The third example I, I want to highlight is cross-thematic product mixes. Um, so information that was published just two weeks ago from Localytics actually saw a huge sales spike for the Galaxy S3 whenever it was compared to the iPhone 5. The first time that happened was when uh, Apple actually won the case over Samsung uh, in the litigation. And the second time that that happened was with the release of the iPhone 5. Um, and what happened on the internet was with both those cases, um, because they're compared so closely together, tons of um, sort of comparison spreadsheets went out. And, and what it did was actually, in spite of you know, the iPhone 5 being a huge release, it also brought this tertiary spike for the Samsung Galaxy because it brought this increased brand awareness and, um, um, and just, yeah, the awareness of the product and its, and its features. Um, the example I've put up here is the Nokia Lumia 920 and the 8, uh, HTC 8X. Um, they're another product, two, two other products that once again, they've uh, been compared uh, with what's ha what they're both their own takes on the Windows platform, how they're similar, how they're different. And that's something, that, it creates an engaging conversation between sales staff and customers to kind of bring in those tensions, but to capitalize on it for sales. And uh, so this is a, a pretty obvious merchandising technique or strategy, um, particularly in our, our industry. Um, and that's placing related products near each other to suggest additional items and, and uh, increase add-on sales. Uh, presenting items of similar color, manufacturer, presenting accessories or even add-on items such as warranty will help uh, increase revenue. You could even present um, competing products. Um, perhaps you want to push consumers who tend to lead towards a certain product, uh, towards a similar product that might generate uh, more revenue for your location. Uh, this is an example here of, uh, from the fashion industry. Um, I'm a sucker for this one. This is a handbag store, and you can see that they've neatly placed the matching shoes and sunglasses uh, next to this display. Um, and they look great together, uh, so I, of course, need to get all three. Um, but you can see that it's just been presented in a really simple and casual way. They look great together. Uh, if you buy one, you have to buy the other as well. The strategy I've chosen to kind of highlight for, for related items here is with um, how you can really improve uh, your profits by, with a product that like the iPhone here, which is ne not necessarily, or it has smaller margins than some other devices out there, but by really highlighting related products, you increase the um, attachment ratio and of course your profits. This is a really uh, important uh, one. This is to know your customers and to design your digital shelf space uh, to suit them. Uh, so an example of you know, different demographics for different locations, uh, perhaps you have a metro mall location, you're located in downtown core area. The bulk of your customers that come into that location are business customers. Leather cases, additional chargers, they seem to 
fly off the shelf in this location. Uh, so you highlight these products and, and maybe other, other products that might be inter of interest to them as well, additional travel accessories. Uh, customer demographics will change uh, from location to location, so it's really important that you're tailoring your displays uh, differently depending on, on the customers for those locations. Um, in some cases, you might be trying to draw in a demographic that might tend to stray away from your, from your store. So this is an example of, of the Adidas store. Uh, they were trying to, to bring in the younger female demographic that tended to stray away from their, their, their inventory of soccer cleats and soccer apparel. Uh, so what they did is they actually they partnered with uh, Stella McCartney, a really famous uh, fashion designer with a pretty famous dad. Um, and to design this, this whole new line of, of products targeted specifically for that demographic. And then they, they went around and they created uh, these really amazing merchandising displays geared directly for this to target those customers and try and draw them into the store. And this, is, this was quite successful for them. So here's an example of a similar strategy. I've decided to make it Creature Week at my store here. Uh, highlight all these cases that have this kind of fun, spunky style. Um, and the interesting thing to, here is that this is something, it highlights that you need to start out with a goal and then monitor what happens so that you can tell if this strategy has been effective. Uh, Jackie mentioned that you might want to go for different demographics. The other thing that you could test out is changing the habits of your current demographic that's coming in. So maybe you place something like this in one of your stores that is in a high traffic location for people of um, working in a business environment that, you know what, they've bought all the leather folios they're ever going to need, but maybe when they see something like this they think, oh yeah, that would be great for my niece, nephew, daughter, something like that. Uh, and once again, just find a, a new market with where you already are. So one of the oldest uh, retail strategies uh, is bringing uh, key products or, or sale items to the front of your store and creating dra dramatic displays to really draw attention to these products. This is uh, an example of uh, Hermes window uh, where they're, they're showcasing, you can see their, their, their scarves, which is probably one of their most iconic products. Um, and what we have here is a picture of a woman blowing um, on the scarf and they actually have fans placed in the back to create uh, that visual effect. Um, or perhaps you might want to draw attention uh, to your new warranty program. This is a window display uh, at, an at an Apple store, actually. Uh, so this is just a really um, creative uh, way to draw attention to, to certain products. Mm -hmm. um, the, the idea behind this, though, is to just be really fun and creative, uh, and it'll draw customers into your store. Um. So maybe you've got something like scarves, which are already very easily differentiate themselves and people are, are drawn to one or the other visually. Um, what I've done here is something with um, Bluetooth, something that you, know, you look at a number of devices and from first glance when you're talking about that, just catching on to the visual side of things might not jump out one or the other. They're all, um, in this case, kind of black or chrome. But by using these sales feature tags, or bestseller, or new, you bring a visual interest to an area on the page and get some clicks there, get people looking at it and engaging with the device, at which point that's when they'll discover the features and those things that'll lead to their, the sale. And um, another way you can do that is just within ad play too, you, you quickly, you want to uh, synchronize with the marketing of your carrier. So if, some, if um, Sprint is featuring a number of phones for the spring, uh, you will pull those into your advertising as well because there's already an awareness out there from their larger advertising and then you bring that into your store as well. So at times, uh, some of your inventory items uh, can be really difficult to display. Uh, some products are really small. Uh, you can't just leave them out on display or, or leave them available for customers to pick up um, and interact with them or take a closer look at them or they might just walk out of your store. This first example here is an example of a watch store and as you can see, uh, it's, it's not really engaging for, for customers. Everything is un, under, under glass. At the other end of the spectrum, some items are too large uh, to display, or maybe you just have too much inventory and you can't display all of it. Uh, so this is an example of a canoe store. 
Um, as wireless retailers, uh, you understand that at times inventory and merchandising space can be tight. Uh, so the nice thing, the really nice thing about digital merchandising is it gives you this digital playground where you can actually easily play around with, with how you display products, add additional products that you might not even be able to carry in inventory and present these to customers. You can promote additional merchandise outside of your, your existing inventory. Or, um, Do exactly what we said earlier. <laughs> we'll ship this to you. Yeah, exactly. It, it, you just imagine being able to gauge interest on a whole new line of cases without actually having to take the risk of, of bringing all that inventory into your stores. So what I'm showing here is this is a product that would be extremely difficult uh, for a number of reasons to, to easily merchandise. So this tiny movie camera that's about the size of my thumb, uh, A, to get some attention to that in store, I would need to put some nice big signs flashing, come look at me. Or also, even once I've got it there, how do you lock one of those kinds of things down, ensure it, uh, safety from theft or anything like that? By putting it into a digital medium, you can blow it up larger than life, easily see this media, get a look for the, um, a sense of the look and feel of a product. And, and to even kind of take that one step further, there are a lot of products that we offer that don't even physically exist in any way. So by bringing this uh, wireless warranty, device warranty, um, into a digital space, you create something that customers can interact with, click the related products on the side, say, yeah, I can add that to this tablet, to this phone, um, and, and just kind of interact with something, whereas otherwise it just kind of exists as a concept. So one of the keys to, to merchandising uh, is, is being creative and inserting your own kind of brand or flair. Uh, every brand retailer has a story um, or their own personality. Uh, it's been said if shoppers were only interested in price, uh, there wouldn't be much retail. So the variety of retail we have today proves that different people value different things when it comes to acquiring goods. The trick is to find the value beyond the transaction. So find out what the customer values uh, and work relent relentlessly uh, to make that connection with them. Inserting your own uh, personal flair uh, into your merchandising is what will help the consumer make that connection with you, the retailer, and not just the product that they're buying in your locations. Um, and that's what eventually will bring them back. Uh, an example here, this is a, a store in China that, that went all out to ring in uh, the year of the tiger. You can see uh, they placed tiger heads on all the mannequins and, and created some really kind of outstanding displays. Um, so they made it really fun and, and playful. Mm -hmm. So once again, we bring this into the digital space and you talk about your own style. Part of that's already be, being communicated by the fact that you're engaging in digital merchandising, that you're letting people interact with your products in a digital space. That's saying to you, to your customers, that you're forward thinking and once exactly what I said earlier about um, you know, being a, a high-tech medium and projecting that high-tech message it, through that. Um, so this is something that infusing your own style goes down into store design right onto the kind of content that you put on screens. So um, here's one from Virgin Mobile in Canada, uh, an ad that you could throw on uh, a digital uh, signage screen that you know, makes some parallels between your store and the content. And just as another example, here I've thrown up a number of screenshots of the different kind of branding that you can have through um, XQ. The themes can be personalized. You ask us, and we'll personalize them to, to your needs and your store style. So we've talked a lot about merchandising being an art, uh, that creative spark, that idea of testing things out and seeing what happens. Now we're going to go to that aspect of testing things out more as a science, merchandising as a science. This is where it's really important that you think about, you start with a goal, you try something creative, and then this is, the, where the rubber hits the road is when you look at the metrics and see what's happened. And you can use uh, RQ4 and XQ reporting and even the new, new BI reporting to make really effective decisions um, with those real-time stats. Uh, and that gives you the ability to quickly identify what's going on and then respond to these trends and patterns. You can monitor sales by category, by product, location to ensure 
you're really promoting the right products and accessories that are in demand in those locations. You can also highlight products that are high in inventory and haven't moved in a while. Um, rotate that stock. And also maximize profitability by highlighting some high, high revenue products. Um, so I'm going to just give you a real, real life example here. This has probably happened to, to everyone in this room at one point. Um, you run an inventory report and you realize that you have way too much of one accessory. This is an example of a Bluetooth accessory. And Bluetooth accessories, um, it's an example of a product that there's new Bluetooth headsets coming out all the time. So it's a reality that if you have too many of an old product, you may be stuck with them <laughs> forever. Uh, so um, it's really important uh, to, to try and push through these products as quickly as possible. Uh, so one of the ways that we can, we can combat this is, is create a promotion in the store. Um, perhaps we, we make this headset 25% off. We can highlight this headset as a, as a related item, as a, the number one related item for all uh, compatible products. We can also highlight uh, this headset with a sale tag in the accessories tab. And then we can also create some digital posters and places on the ad play screens uh, in the store. And what's really great about that is it's really easy to, to make these changes. Perhaps you want to just throw this promotion up for one weekend and see if it gains any traction. If it doesn't, then, then maybe there's another strategy. Uh, so now we're going to hop forward briefly to Omnichannel. Um, hopefully some of you guys got to see the presentation by our colleagues Tara and Anne this morning where they talked all about it. But we want to just talk about a little bit about digital merchandising's role in this. Um, so what is Omnichannel? Uh, it's basically aims to offer a seamless experience whether, depending uh, regardless of the channel that someone that a shopper is accessing uh, uh, your your retail through so in store bricks and mortar the uh, internet at home with your computer or mobile as you move between those places this is a, an example of UK's biggest internet grocery store and they created these interactive shelves at train stations uh, throughout uh, and bus stops throughout London uh, what this is is just a, a digital billboard and, and every product, ind individual product has its own QR code. So while I'm sitting and waiting uh, to head home on, on the bus and I'm and already thinking about the things I need to pick up on my way home, I can actually start adding these items to my basket, shoot that basket off to the grocery store and have them have that either delivered to my home or ready for me to pick up on my way out the door. So this is just a really great example of how they've connected that mobile experience right to the in-store experience. And here's just one example of how XQ is moving towards that um, omni-channel presence. Um, first screenshot I have off in the left there is of a, a, a shopping list that someone made in-store through Browse. Then maybe they're not ready for the purchase yet, or maybe this was at a kiosk that wasn't manned at the time. They can scan the QR code and then take those products with them for further consideration or coming back to the store to, to purchase. So we've got just a couple tips for omnichannel merchandising. <laughs> Uh, yes, just a few, few tips. The, the most important thing is to just really have a consistent messaging uh, across um, all of these channels. Uh, you want to know and cater to the different demographics, um, and they may be, because that might be different uh, depending on the channel. Understand uh, that some of the messages um, are more effectively communicated in some of these mediums. So one thing that you guys may have been thinking throughout all of this is you're wondering, um, what's that return on the investment? This is, it takes time to, to, to spend merchandising um, things you already do in physically in store and work it on it in the digital space as well. Well, the, the analogy I'd like to bring up here is to social media. Um, and the reason I do that is because with both digital merchandising and social media, there's definitely an expectation on part of consumers of at your fingertips data and really connectivity and fresh sources. Um, so one of the basic tenets of social media uh, and, and marketing through social networks is that it requires a time investment. Um, creating a page 
as I've got shown here, uh, and tweeting for a week got me five followers. And that's pretty good for one week. I, I was proud of that. But then I stopped tweeting, and I have also not had any new followers since about June when I did that. <laughs> so that, of course, makes me sad. And this is something that I think a lot of people have experienced when uh, first engaging with social, with social networking. Um, you create a, a Facebook page, and you might have some, some followers at first, or, or, or maybe it takes time to ramp up, but then if, if you can't upkeep it, no one will continue to come back because there's no content that's making them want to come back in the first place. So this is why it's really important that you put that investment of time in. And the way this is all distilled down is if you spend time with your content, people will spend time in your store because there's, there's new and engaging information for them. And then, of course, the final result of that is that the more time people spend in your store, the more they will buy. And Paco Underhill, um, he's kind of considered a guru of um, psychology and beha behavioral psychology, and specifically for people um, shopping. Um, and he, he wrote the really famous book, Why We Buy, The Science of Shopping. And what he said is that the amount of time a shopper spends in the store is directly, um, pretty well, directly proportional, or at the very least, a very important factor in deciding how much that person will buy. So, of course, to get those returns, it's important to have uh, someone to manage uh, your digital merchandising. Uh, and we suggest someone who um, is really aware of the new products and trends in your locations. And they really understand the target demographics and strategies to reach uh, your customers through merchandising. Uh, and we also uh, suggest they really have a keen awareness of your branding and marketing strategies. Um, and here's just a, a few, we'll just summarize just a few of these key concepts. Uh, so, so one of the first things is to really make sure that you start off with a goal. Know what you want to achieve uh, through your merchandising in terms of sales, um, demographic bumps, store brand. Um, be creative with it. Um, the really great thing about uh, digital merchandising is that it's so easy to switch up. You're not spending tons of money on, on huge physical displays. You have the ability to, to change things up with a click click of the mouse. Um, you want to try new things until you find something that works. So test, test, test. Uh, try out different strategies. Check out the, the metrics on that. See if it's working. If not, try something else. Uh, and also, um, make sure that you're providing a consistent message across all, all channels. So ensure that your digital merchandising is um, and your brand message in store is also matching uh, your mobile strategies, your social media strategies, and your e-commerce strategies. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>